when I started. Right? You mean talking, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. for being here, whether you are here in the our attendees tonight um, to this Vital Voices event from financial functional to financial literacy. Uh, I'm Dr. Ashley, public service. And on behalf of Dean Schwartz, I would like to officially welcome you uh, all, especially our distinguished guests, um, who we'll be recognizing here in a moment uh, to the event this evening. So the combination of disciplines in our education, uh, criminal justice, a unique impact, a really unique impact on our community by working in the, the spaces where these disciplines intersect. Um, this, this topic that we're, we're focusing on this evening, as well as the related work happening in our financial coaching and economic stability uh, lab, which is housed in our Center for Public Service and Community Research, epitomizes our college's commitment to equity and making a positive difference in the greater Houston community just stated in our vision for the college. The Financial Coaching and Economic Stability was started in 2020 and is headed by Mr. Richard Simons, who will be here. Uh, and its, its purpose is to improve the financial health of our students and all Houstonians. The training they receive, the coaching they will do, um, research in collaboration with our community. So we're really excited about the work of the lab and especially the information that we will be able to. I'd like to thank on behalf of the, the financial institutions who have partnered with us to support our lab related events, as well as provide resources for student scholarships. And these are Regions Bank. Um, <laughs> and uh, and Truist, and we could not do the work with you. So thank you so much for your support. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Stephen Milano, who's working diligently back there, uh, the director of our Center for Public Service and Community for his dedication to these efforts and also for organizing this Vital Voices event. So I would now like to introduce uh, Mr. Richard Simons and he will get us started. So thank you.
Thank you. It's always nice to be introduced and people applaud before you even say anything. So it, it, it tests things out on a good foot. So I just want to take a few minutes real quick as we get going to let you know how this came to be. So, so I called my good friend from the mayor's uh, Office of Adult Literacy, Jackie, and I said, Jackie, we need to do something. Right. The College of Public Service, inside this college, we have social workers, we have people from urban education, our future teachers, and we have our criminal justice professionals. And that's such a unique combination of students and majors inside a college. And we needed to do something to highlight the work and the connection that's being done in the city. And just through conversations, this is uh, what we've come. So thank you so much again for being here with us in person. Thank you for being us, with us here in Zoom. We're excited just to have kind of an open conversation about some of these topics. Um, that we are working uh, together for. So I would like to recognize just a few people um, in the room as we uh, go and we're gonna be hearing from them. So we are excited that, no. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that at least asked. Okay, excellent. Um, and so I, I am excited that um, before I get going, we, we did just hear that our president, Lauren Blanche, was caught up for a quick minute, but he is going to be coming here very, very shortly. So yes, I am trying to extend my speech. <laughs> yeah, so okay, so, so, so let's just be honest and transparent what we're doing. What's that? Oh, I know it does. I know. Um, but, but, but for me, um, for people who know my story a little bit, um, financial wellness is a social justice issue. Being able to provide basic supports, basic needs so that our communities can grow and our communities can be stable as we prosper just as communities, but also as a city is a fundamental need that we have. And that's really what the work that the lab does, where it comes from. You know, as we mentioned, Dr. Blackburn said real briefly about some of the lab work is I'm so thankful for United Way of Greater Houston and the Thrive Partners and the Wesley Community Centers in the house. I know that Women's Resource Center is online and a few other people are as well. Um, but we are able to uh, train social workers to be financial coaches and do their internship and the required practicum inside those organizations and agencies. So that is something really, really cool and great that's out there because our social workers, and again, I'm a social worker, so I'm just a little bit biased, but our social workers, I think, I think are amazing and do amazing work here in Houston. I'm so proud of each of them. And I know we have a, a good group of social workers here in the room. So I'm super excited about that and some of the lab that we're doing, but at a heart, it comes as a place of service. And that is what we want to do and that's what we are doing. So. Excellent, excellent. So where we're coming. And so, as I mentioned before, I know that the president is here and he really wanted to be here to, to provide well wishes and talk a little bit about his vision for where University of Houston uh, downtown has come from, where it is going and why he is excited to be part of our university. In just one second. Okay. Why does he come? I know he is going to acknowledge a few people in the room but as we are waiting, I would like to acknowledge a few people in the room. So we are very, very blessed um, that U.S. Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia has joined us to talk about the um, President and CEO of United Way, Amanda McMillan, has joined us, and she's been speaking in the for Saturday night. And then also um, the Director of Mayor's Office of Adult Literacy, of Federico Salas and Sinardi. It's been a mainstay of what we're doing. And I don't want to steal too much of their thunder, but the Mayor's Office of Adult Literacy is one of the most amazing offices, both here in the city and through city governments across the country. They are doing this very uh, amazing and innovative work on how they are not just providing services, but how they're coordinating efforts of our literacy providers and looking, taking literacy beyond just the ability to read and write. Um, through the blueprint that I know he's going to talk about, it's how they take literacy and move beyond those pieces. So we're excited that he is going to be here as well. So with that, does anyone know how far the president is? Because I'm really struggling here in a minute. I've got a lot of stuff I want to say, but there's some amazing people here that are. He's here, so this is Richard Sang. <laughs> It is a great pleasure and honor to, to introduce uh, the president of the University of Houston downtown. 
with an orb lantern on who has made some time. <laughs> Wow, I didn't know I had reached celebrity status. So <laughs> never been uh, greeted so warmly as I've come into the doors. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to obviously extend a, a warm welcome to um, all of you who are uh, here today. And, you know, along with a, a special thanks uh, to the uh, to uh, the Frederico Salas Isnadi, uh, who is the director of the Mayor's Office of Adult Literacy that I know is here with us today. Uh, Jackie Aguilera, project manager of the Mayor's Office of for Adult Literacy is back there. Yep. Um, and also to recognize our very own uh, financial coaching and economic stability lab. I'm coming to you in a minute. Uh, <laughs> our, our fearless leader here. Um, um, ec economic Stability Lab staff for their collaboration on this event. Um, specifically, we know that Mr. Uh, Richard Simons um, for leading our Financial Coaching and Economic Stability Lab and the College of Public Services Data Analytics uh, so well. So I also want to especially thank you for fostering the kind of collaboration that really supports our city's economic health and sustainability efforts. Partnerships like the one that we are celebrating here today between the Mayor's Office for Adult Literacy, the United Way of Greater Houston and the University of Houston downtown are really at the heart of, of everything that we stand for as an institution. Uh, Ms. Amanda McMillan, thank you for your role in uh, leading the United Way of Greater Houston. We are honored by your presence here today. Um, additionally, uh, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia, we're always thrilled to see you. Of course, it seems like now this is two weeks back to back that we're seeing each other. So love it when you're, you're here with us here at the University of Houston downtown. But also we wanna thank you for your deep involvement uh, in this essential program and your support of the collaborative efforts represented here today. Uh, we look forward to learning about the Multilingual Financial Literacy Act, which we know is so important. Uh, to a city as linguistically diverse as ours is here in Houston. I also want to acknowledge our very own Dean, uh, Dean Jonathan Schwartz. I'm sure he's somewhere in the room. He's the body was. That's unusual because, you know, he's a man who's everywhere. So, um, and Dean of our College of Public Service for not only for his leadership, but for obviously hosting uh, this event here today. So let me just give you a few uh, remarks that I think is really important and that really sets the context for why this event really means so much. This, this conversation, I should say, means so much to the University of Houston downtown. We're steadfastly fastly concerned with issues that create barriers to higher education um, and to socioeconomic mobility. Financial literacy is one of those issues. In fact, the current state of financial literacy is quite alarming. According to a national student, student financial wellness survey, only 21% of college students were able to correctly answer three basic questions related to loan terms, interest rates, and repayment options. 73% of student respondents with student loan debt were less than confident that they would be able to pay off their loans. And 70% of students at four-year universities across the nation say that they worry most about having enough money to pay for college expenses. So that's nationally. Let's bring it down to the University of Houston downtown, where we recently surveyed our students around financial well-being. Here's what we learned. 78% of our students state that they worry about money more than half the time. Over 75% of our UHD students are not sure how they're going to pay tuition next semester. Uh, and two out of three of our employed students are working to support themselves, their children, their parents, their grandparents, and or their siblings. As a university, we are really striving to address our students' financial concerns, which is really critical to meeting the first goal of our strategic plan, which is entitled Enhancing Student Success. Uh, addressing student success requires responding to students' basic needs, and financial insecurities. With the help of the US Department of Education, 
we recently received a grant to begin or initiate our basic needs center that expands financial assistance to students experiencing financial emergencies so that they can stabilize and pursue their degrees without having to stop out. Thank you. By expanding financial assistance, it's only one part of this, the solution. Increasing financial literacy is an essential step in the process of addressing the financial insecurities and challenges of our students and their families in a manner to, that leads to sustainable change. Disrupting counterproductive habits and ways of thinking with financial education is essential to addressing and reversing the economic insecurities of residents in many of our Houston's communities. I'm proud of UHD's participation in this financial literacy session today as we strive to expand our footprint and impact on this great city, serving as a hub for educational opportunities such as this, helps to improve the financial health of our city by educating its citizens. Our work shines a light for other urban-centered institutions. Not only are we creating a place where underrepresented populations of students are able to receive a traditional college education, we are layering in the teaching of life skills, such as financial literacy skills, that will maximize our students' ability to transform their lives and their trajectory of their lives by making informed decisions that increase rather than hinder socioeconomic mobility. So today, I know that we are going to explore how functional literacy and financial literacy contribute to our individual success and the success of our society. We will also learn about the state of financial literacy in Texas, how our city's involvement in adult literacy initiatives will impact the city overall, and how our very own College of Public Service, along with the United Way of Greater Houston, are working to, to promote financial literacy. So it's now my pleasure to turn the program back over to Mr. Richard Simons. You all get me again. Um, so as, as President Blunter said, we're excited to serve in Houston and we're excited to be here. Um, it gives great honor. Thank you. Um, it gives me great honor. So I would like to real quickly introduce Jackie Aguilera from the Mayor's Office of Adult Literacy. So this is a fantastic individual. If you've not had a chance to meet her yet, please introduce yourself um, at the end of the session. There we go. See, see a little bit from the peanut gallery. Um, so just real quick. So she has over 35 years experience in education, adult literacy. Um, she's an alumni of the Coalition of Adult Basic Education. And she was a recent recipient of the Ford Foundation's Mujeres Legendarias, if I mispronounce that, I apologize, <laughs> Legendary Women Award. Most importantly, she's a UHD alum, okay? So, so on all the amazing things. And so I'm going to welcome her um, to do the great honor of uh, introducing uh, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia for us for this evening. So. Good evening, everyone. So this makes a homecoming. Thank you very much. It is, thank you. Uh, it is with great enthusiasm that I introduce to you all a legend and a series of firsts. If you look on Congresswoman Garcia's website, you will see an amazing biography, but I'm going to pitch a few of these firsts to you because she is an icon first Latina ever to represent the Texas 29th Congressional District, director and presiding judge of the Houston Municipal System for an unprecedented five terms under two mayors. In 1998, she was elected the city controller, the second highest elected official in Houston city government and became our chief financial officer where she earned the reputation as being the taxpayer's watchdog, <laughs> fighting to protect the pocketbooks of working families and ensuring that the city was transparent and accountable. Two terms as controller, and then she was elected to the Harris County Commissioner's Court as the first Hispanic and first woman to be elected in her own right to that office. 
She was sworn into the Texas State Senate on March 11th, 2013, representing the uh, Senate, Senate District 6. She is the seventh woman and the third Hispanic woman to serve in the upper chambers after winning a special runoff election for the seat of the late Senator Mario Gallegos. In 2018, she took her fight to DC to represent our community, our country, and our families in Congress. In January 3rd of 2019, she was sworn to represent the Texas Congressional District 29, becoming the first Hispanic member of the Houston Congressional Delegation and one of the first two Latinas to represent the state of Texas in Congress. Under this tenure of her service, I had the great privilege of speaking with her office about adult education in Houston and the opportunity to work with her team to contribute to what would become this amazing first, this multilingual financial literacy act, which she introduced in 2022 during adult education and family literacy week while being recognized by the Coalition of Adult Basic Education as a champion for adult literacy. So if you will, please help me in giving a warm welcome to our champion, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia. God, what an introduction. I think now I'm, I, I too am impressed. <laughs> Calling me, and is there? Did I do something to it? Where's the uh, no, I guess it's all right. It'll, it'll be fine. It's wonderful. Okay, good. Um, no, that was such a, a great introduction. And, and um, Chris, remind me to call her next time I need an introduction so much <laughs> because she, she got it all. She got it all, I think. But please don't take me to Washington. <laughs> No, I, I just, we need help with an occasional speech or two sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but it's great to be here at the campus. Mr. President, thank you for, for joining us. And, and uh, I told him that I have always supported U of H downtown, have been, and then many of your predecessors uh, became good friends and hope to, you know, we welcome you and we hope you're enjoying Houston and we hope you stay. Okay, yeah. those are the orders. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the topic of literacy is is really important, and uh, but I'm going to discuss financial literacy for obvious reasons. I've been city controller, and I now, I now sit on the Financial Services Committee, which is a committee in Congress that has oversight over all the banking industry, whether it's credit unions, banks, uh, programs that help, help uh, businesses, with, with financial, uh, uh, for financial resources. And it also includes housing. And, and it includes housing because for housing, it's been a lot of the funding that's needed, which again is money uh, to be able uh, to, to create opportunities for people to either buy a home, rent a home, or get a home if you're homeless or, or need public housing assistance. So that's what I do. Uh, I'm on the subcommittee on housing and uh, consumer which again, this is about consumers, right? It's about consumers and their ability to tap into uh, the financial services industry. Uh, so for me, it's it's um, a very huge, hugely, I'm talking like one more twice in each president. Did I say hugely? <laughs> it's a, for me, it's a huge um, uh, uh, goal to make sure that everybody has access to capital. You know, you were talking, Mr. President, about the students and the hurdles of financial uh, uh, dilemmas that they may have in their school loans and, and just trying to make it to get through a semester. I remember that, remember? I was a student too. I went through some of that. Uh, when we talk about literacy generally, I went through that. My daddy was functionally illiterate. He could not read, write, or speak English, and he could not read or write Spanish, he just spoke Spanish. So I still remember that he used to sign with just an X. And with time, because he went to an adult basic education program that the county had, 
and we used to coach him and coach him. He was finally able to write Luis A. Garcia. No more. So proud of that. But just think what that would do to go through some programs like that for people who just have trouble opening a bank account statement and figuring out what the hell it means. Or if you buy a home, you know, we have bankers here. You know, you get those forms. I mean, I remember my closing, there was two tables this long with different stacks of paper. And you were just explaining. And, you know, again, I'm lucky I'm a lawyer and a former judge, and I understood a lot of it. I think about the average person who just doesn't understand all the legal mumbo jumbo. But I tell people that's really just being bad on lawyers. Because it's legal mumbo jumbo that, that the real estate people want, that this other group wants. And before you know it, there's just so much there. So just maneuvering through all that is always, always very hard. So we know that financial literacy is important to everyone no matter what age, no matter what, what a background, and certainly no matter what educational attainment. Because I'll be the first one to tell you that even as a lawyer, when I get some documents uh, in my hand, figure out what they're trying to tell me, especially if it's a medical uh, uh, letter. So before we even talk about literacy, we need to talk about simplifying plain English documents so that the average person can know what they're, they're doing. Because only one third of Americans have a sufficient understanding of financial concepts such as interest rates. Interest rates. Y'all know what that is, right? Yeah. Interest rates and financial risk. We all know what it's about. But figuring it out and what it does, especially if you have a credit card and you see your statement and how much you owe, and then it tells you you pay this much, but then it tells you now at least they disclose that if you don't pay that amount, then you'll ultimately end up paying this much. But still, you've got to maneuver through all that. So shockingly, this, this measure of financial literacy has decreased by 19% over the past decade. That means that in the last 10 years, there's 19% more people that have financial literacy than before. So according to a recent report for the National Financial Educators Council, a significant number of individuals, 38%, 38% indicated that their limited financial literacy had a financial cost for them in 2023. Because they didn't understand something, it cost them something. For example, the example I used today at, at a business group, uh, when I was explaining my act, I said, just imagine that you get a letter uh, from your mortgage company that tells you that you're delinquent in these two payments. And if you don't pay by this time, your delinquency rate will race to this. But if you do this, and by the time you get through it, you don't know what the hell to do. That's in English. And you're an average person in my district, which is 77% Latino. They're not going to understand it anyway, unless it's in Spanish. But even if they read it in Spanish, because they're not literate and don't know about mortgage rates and revolving interest rates and some of the other language that is used, they still won't understand it. So again, if we look at, 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 at 10,000, it costs them to fall behind $10,000 or more. So not knowing what was in the forms and the documents, 38% more people put themselves at risk and ended up having to pay $10,000 or more. So imagine that you don't have any money as it is. So you borrowed or you did something, uh, um, you know, got a contract somewhere and you got it, but then you didn't understand it, that it ended up costing you more money. So that's what we're trying to get here. We want to make sure that people understand what their, their responsibilities are and what the consequences are uh, when we do this. So this increase is, is quite shocking, quite frankly, which is why it's essential that we prioritize financial education to ensure that individuals can make informed decisions and avoid unnecessary hardships.
you don't want to end up having to pay so much more for borrowing money than if you would have been able to pay for it initially. So unfortunately for millions of people in our country, language barriers make it challenging to access the financial resources and information they need to make to make informed decisions. Over 20% of US households speak a language other than English. It's not just my district. It's not just Houston being so diverse. 20% across the country speaks language other than English. And nearly 9% who speak English say they, they speak English with less than very well. So that's a high number of people that need help in language. This means that over 65 million people in our nation speak a language other than English at home. And more than 26 million of those individuals have limited English proficiency. So that's the group I worry about the most because although I, I don't have it in my remarks, but I, because I've done work in this area for some time, if you add to that, that many of the, many of the people that we're talking about are from the lower income uh, a salary bracket, that makes it even harder because they don't understand they get themselves in more dilemmas. There are over 380 different languages spoken in the US and nearly 9% of the individuals speak English less than very well. The last time I looked, Houston, I think, had 122 languages in Houston ISD spoken. That's a lot. Remember when you go vote? There's a ballot in English, there's a ballot in Spanish, there's a ballot in Vietnamese, and there's a ballot in Chinese here in Harris County. In all of Texas, the requirement is English and Spanish. So it's simple, right? If they can do it on our ballot, why can't they do it on the forms that you sign at the bank? You know, at the credit union for the car loan that you're getting, or even just any other contract that you do, whether it's uh, to go to storage lots now, you have to sign a contract. And they just kind of, oh no, just click here and then click here and click here. They don't even want you to read it. But that's what we're talking about. So the language barriers are on top of the literacy barriers. It makes things even worse. So it can be challenging for these individuals to access financial literacy resources and education, putting them at a significant disadvantage regarding financial success. So that's why I have introduced, we'll be introducing two bills uh, uh, in the next coming month. One is the Multilingual Financial Literacy Act and the other is the Community Finance Language Inclusion Act. The first one is the Multilingual Financial Literacy Act. I know we do it in Congress to really use a lot. But actually require uh, the Financial Literacy Education Commission, which is a commission that looks at all these issues nationally, to conduct a study on the impact of language barriers on financial health. Following this study, they will issue a report with recommendation on addressing these, in, these barriers to achieve better financial inclusion for those with limited English proficiency. So it's a simple bill. It just says, go study it. You know, and sometimes we need that because for me to be able to do work, people may say, oh no, well, that doesn't really bother everybody, everybody. Everybody really speaks English. But remember the number I just gave you what was 68 million do not. And that's a lot of people. And, and there's another bunch of people that are limited in English. So the second bill is the Community Finance Language Inclusion Act, which will expand the official definition of technical assistance with the Community Development Financial Institution Fund. And they're called CDFIs. And what they are is like centers, resource centers that we have uh, through the, I think it's SBA, that go out in the community and provide technical assistance to businesses. So what we're suggesting is that the definition of technical assistance be expanded so that it include outreach materials in additional languages other than English. Because it's really saying, it's great that you're doing this and are helping people succeed and have small businesses, but it doesn't help everybody if you don't also include English proficiency and helping others who don't speak English. So it's two simple bills because it's important that everyone in America have the opportunity to thrive financially 
And, I, and it's not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. I mean, wouldn't the bank want more customers? If customers knew what, what, what they were doing and then came back over and over again, I know you all would like it, wouldn't you? <laughs> you know, or the credit union. I mean, I'm not here to sell banks. I mean, credit unions or wherever, or where you, wherever you get your car loans. I mean, have you all ever been to a car salesman when you buy a car? I mean, they give you less time to review paper than even the banks. Because they just want you to sign in there so they can get their commission on selling that car. So the consumer must be protected. So this is especially important uh, during this time because remember, about 5% of Americans are unbanked. They don't even have a checking account or a savings account. So they're not used to anything having to do with finances. And then about 20%, that's one in five, have no credit card. So again, they're not used to the transactions. But, but if we all work together, we can make sure that there's financial literacy resources in every one of our neighborhoods. And I know that, that we're doing our part in trying to get um, some money to the uh, to city of Houston uh, through a, a grant request for through the Houston Financial Empowerment Center for $621,000 to work on this. And those are uh, community project uh, funding dollars that I get to I get to decide uh, which which community groups some federal dollars should come to, and it's for the smaller uh, nonprofits rather than giving money to a bank, you give it to uh, that's working on these issues. Because again, these things are really about embracing the diversity that that we have in our country, but it's also about making sure that everybody has access to capital. Because unless you have capital, and capital is just a fancy word for money. <laughs> money. And you ain't saying, and I, please forgive me, Mr. President, but I'm gonna say, the, say a, a word you may not be very kind to, but it's the old saying that money talks, bullshit box. Okay? And that's the way it is. But there's things that we could do and I'm pleased to, that my, my bills hopefully will get some attention and that we continue to work on this. And it's great that we've got a city and a mayor who believe in that and have a, a, a city government that, 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 that is out there uh, making sure that we have more literacy and financial literacy in, in Houston and uh, nonprofits like the United Way that, that can bring money to the table for some of these nonprofits. Because a lot of this work, y'all, it's, it's not only the uh, communities that are unbanked, have no credit cards, don't speak the language, but they also don't have the resources. So we can't expect them to come to a center downtown. We need to do more about bringing the services to the community. Mm -hmm. Go where they are. I call it, I told this to Dr. Fauci when we were discussing where, where we needed to go test. I said, Dr. Fauci, we need the taco truck model. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And he says, talk with truck model. Okay, well, Congressman Garcia, I don't think I've heard of that. I said, well, it's simple. You, it, it's a car, a truck, and then you've got the food, and you go where the people are working. Mm -hmm. I said, we've got this test. We should get mobile units and take them where the people are. Mm -hmm. And if it is at an employment center, you get a lot of people. You go, okay, so I'm going to write that down. Mm -hmm. So I call it the taco truck model because you go to where the people are rather than expecting people to come downtown, okay? So I'll leave you with that. I look forward to the questions. Uh, I know that my staff is here. They'll remind me when I need to go to my next event. But it's been, uh, but it's great talking to you and um, you all keep focused on this and, and call my office if you should have any questions. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you so much. I uh, hope your brains are bubbling. Things are going on here and uh, we're thinking green. So um, <laughs> thank you. there you go. Hey, see these guys. Uh, so the next speaker, and I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this very well because he's my boss. <laughs> he's the director of the mayor's office for adult literacy. And together he and I 
equal at least someone in retirement age or more in experience. Uh, but while I do a lot locally and regionally, he has done so much on the state and the national level. As recently as working with the National Barbara Bush Literacy Foundation to create a new type of outreach initiative called All In, which is going to take family and adult literacy to the national level. And it's my privilege to welcome and share him with you, Mr. Federico Salasis Narli. Thank you. I understand why you want her to write your speeches. <laughs> but first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Congre Congresswoman Garcia, President Blanchard, I don't know if he's, yes, still, and all distinguished guests. I bring greetings from Mayor Turner. He regrets not being able to be here. And, but today he said, you can represent me well. After all, Oftentimes, you write anything that I have to say about literacy. So, there we go. Mayor Turner sends his regards and his regret and reiterates his support for concerted efforts to improve the financial literacy and financial well being of families in Houston. He continues to support innovative approaches to bring the latest technology, education, and workforce development to families throughout Houston. So thank you for inviting the mayor, who is not here, but I am send him. I am Federico Salas Isnardi, and Congresswoman Garcia has many firsts. I am the first director, the inaugural director, we call it, of the Mayor's Office for Adult Literacy the only such literacy office in the nation at this time. Richard said that we are doing great things. We are, and that is measured by the number of national guests that are coming to Houston. To doing collective impact for literacy. That is why I was asked to collaborate at the national level on the development of a national action plan for adult literacy that was adopted by Dr. Jill Biden, the first lady of the United States in 2021 in Washington. And we created what they call in coordinating council, a group of national organizations that are taking this national adult literacy plan, trying to implement it locally. And the city of Houston, the only city that is sitting on the National Council because of what we are doing nationally. So, I'm sorry, what we are doing locally. So why did we need an office for adult literacy in Houston? Mayor Turner created it in 2019. Now, to be sure, there were other types of offices in Houston offering literacy as far back as 1980. It was founded in 1986. But in 2019, the situation was of low adult literacy was different. So, and by the way, Richard said he's a social worker and many of you are social workers. Raise your hand if you're social workers. Workers. I am married to a social worker. <laughs> yeah, I am married to a social worker. I understand social work. And sometimes because I am in adult education, my wife and I say, we are serving the same people. So we have a conversation at night and it is a conversation about social work and about adult education at the same time because we are serving the same people. But you have, all of you have a folder and the folder has a QR code in the back 
The QR code is a QR code to the adult, the Houston Adult Literacy Blueprint. And the handouts that you have inside of that folder come from the document called the Adult Literacy Blueprint. I invite you to read it. It's there. But the important thing about the Adult Literacy Blueprint is that Houston not only is the only city that has a mayor's office for adult literacy in the whole nation, but it's the only one that has a strategic plan to tackle the issue of low literacy for the next 15 years. Well, we have 14 left now. Came together in a very different way of doing positive uh, impact. We brought together over 100 organizations. Some of them are sitting right here, like the Wesley Community Center and the United Way. Think about what is it that we need to do, change the situation, to move the needle of adult literacy. I have been in the field of adult literacy for now 36 years. Okay. Conversation about literacy as now. In 2021, June 21, the front of the Houston Chronicle. I mean, my then 35 years in the field said adult, Houston has an adult literacy problem. Name masthead of a newspaper. That is because we are changing the conversation with the help of people like Jackie Aguilera and over 100 partners. But things that you have to consider, 28% of Texans work or perform according to national data, 28%. If you look at Houston and Harris County, the picture is worse. It's 32% of adults in Harris County perform at That is a challenge. So we perform below state and below the nation because Texas trades in the nation also. One in five adults at the lowest level, that is 20%. The percentage is actually 21% at the national level. We have a challenge and we have to address it. Another consideration, racial disparities in literacy rates are connected to historical inequity. Richard mentioned that when he said that financial literacy is an issue of equity. Absolutely, it is an issue of equity. Because the, if you look at the distribution of low literacy rates in Houston, you will see that the communities that are traditionally, historically underserved and under-resourced are the communities where generation after generation, people are under it. The pandemic made that absolutely clear because black and brown communities, immigrant communities, were the communities that were around the nation, not just in Houston, were the communities that were most disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So we talked about uh, financial literacy. It's also an issue of health literacy. This woman spoke about not understanding, people not understanding financial information and documents because they are in English or they are at a high level of English or both. They are in English and you don't speak English or you're limited. And on top of that, they are at a very high level of comprehension and your comprehension is low, okay? All in with health information. So it affects you if you want to sign a paper for uh, your uh, get a loan or sign a contract, but it affects you also when you go to the doctor and have no idea what they are telling you or grab a brochure about your illness, your condition, and cannot understand it, cannot read it. So it affects the health of the community. It affects the financial health and well-being of the community. 
cycle of low literacy impacts individuals across generations. That's what I was saying. That's why historically underserved communities, historically under-resourced communities have an issue with literacy. Because if the child, if the mother is no literate or illiterate, if the caretakers are low literate, the children will not be. There is research that shows that the level of literacy of the mother is the single most important indicator of the chances for success of a child in school. Okay, single most important indicator. So when we're talking about what is happening in our public schools, what is happening to our kids, if the, ki the parents are not well educated and 32% of our adults in Houston are not well educated, then there is no wonder kids are dropping out in seventh, eighth, ninth grade because they were not prepared. So we have to deal with adult literacy at different levels. When I started the partnerships, that we developed, I started to reach out to people who don't work with adults. And they were saying, but why are you, we work with toddlers or we work with uh, elementary age kids. And I said, yeah, I'm sure. But if you're working with a third grader and something is happening to their level of literacy, in 10 years, your third grader is gonna be an adult needing adult literacy services. And if it, you're working with a toddler, let's plan together. Let's, let's look at literacy as a continuum. Low, low rates of adult literacy come at, as a tremendous cost to the economy. Uh, in fact, we worked with the Gallup Foundation when we were putting this together. And thanks to the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation, we were able to afford top quality document that the blueprint is. Gallup found the, the Gallup um, people said, the economy, Harris County, not just Houston, the whole county, see a gain of 3.3% to its translates into $13 billion a year. Everybody's literacy one, one level higher. Just one level higher would translate into dollars to the economy of Houston. That is why I'm committed to the work that we are doing, because it would translate into better outcomes for our children, better outcomes for our uh, economy, better outcomes for planning long-term for the city of Houston. Contributes to increase revenue and greater productivity. The productivity increases when people So literacy unlocks improved healthcare costs Literacy is the child's future. No literacy education offers the opportunity, and this is very important also. National system. Okay. So, Sheriff last year, and he said 73% of people in the national system in Harris County are illiterate. 73%. Okay, so it's important that we come together as a community with the government, the federal government, the state government, the So I'm gonna leave you now. But because of all this that I have spoken, changing the model for our office for the first two or three years, our model was Literacy is the heartbeat of Houston. Now we have changed that. Without literacy, there is no equity. That's what we are talking about. Literacy is about equity and about equitable outcomes for our population. And finally, one last one. The Congresswoman talked, and I loved it, the taco truck model. 
one thing that we are about to launch, and this is news to you, <laughs> is a bus. We are going to take computers and top-notch uh, technology to the communities that need it. Classes, whatever they are needed. Thank you for your attention. I invite you to look at the blueprint. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all so much. Um, so we are excited. We have one more uh, presentation this evening and it gives me great honor and great pleasure. And with as much enthusiasm as Jackie Aguilera has, I want to introduce, I'm trying Jackie, I told you, uh, to do, but I, I, I am in all honesty, I'm excited to introduce uh, Ms. Amanda McMillan, who is the president and CEO of United Way of Greater Houston. Uh, before joining the United Way, um, she was the executive vice president and general counsel of Anadarko. Um, along for multiple honors and recognitions. The one that stood out the most, right, when I was reading it, is that she was recognized as one of the most powerful businesswomen in Texas by the National Diversity Council. That's a huge deal on what she's doing. And so with that, I'm going to recognize I'm going to pull everything together for us to So much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone um, here in the room and also joining us online this evening. Um, I am so thrilled to be in a room full of barrier busters this evening um, because that is what y'all do. Um, we are, we're so grateful for our relationship with the College of Public Service and the, the incredible work you are doing every day to build stronger, more equitable communities. Um, tr truly an honor. And um, was so excited to be here tonight to talk about this, this critical topic. Um, you know, we, you all know this from your work here already, right? Um, we know that our neighbors face extraordinary challenges right now. Um, and, you know, just making ends meet, much less really becoming financially stable. Um, I'll cite some stats that like, y'all probably already know. Um, at United Way of Greater Houston, um, an important data set for us um, is ALICE, which stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. Uh, we actually have updated data coming out soon, so watch for that. Um, but but we know from that data that 14% of households across Greater Houston um, are below the federal poverty line. They try to live on wages below the federal poverty line. We know another 33% of households um, are trying to live on wages above the federal poverty line, but they are struggling to take care of the basics. They are having to make choices that no person should have. They're trying to choose between, do I pay my rent or do I put food on the table? Do I pay my utilities bill or do I go get that prescription for my sick relative? Um, no one should have to make these choices. Um, and I'm grateful for every single one of you um, and the work that you're pursuing to help create better futures for people all over our community. I'll talk just briefly about United Way of Greater Houston. Um, we've been around 100 years now. We've been celebrating our centennial all year. Very exciting. Our, um, our job really is to unite um, donors, volunteers, and community partners around a focus plan to remove barriers to financial stability. Um, we, we made a shift in our strategy over the last couple of years. We've been operating under this new strategy for about a year now. Um, and we're also here um, to still help with basic needs and be the community's front door for help and hope through our Texas United Way 2 one Helpline, um, which connected over 1.2 million people um, to services last year. That's a lot of people. That number's all over the state of Texas too. We we serve our broader region and we also actually also cover 70% of the state of Texas at night. Um, and so with, with this journey, one of the things we, we talked about and, and it's foundational and so directly related to what the Mayor's Office of Adult Literacy is doing. Um, we know at least what we've called it is the integrated client journey. Um, and it really helps create people, uh, opportunities for people to prosper through financial stability programs, and also like some key supports along the way, right? Access to really high quality, affordable early childhood needs development programs, access to high quality, affordable health care, making sure that foundation of basic needs is, is there so you can have your basics met along the way on that journey. Um, and, and really not just to achieve financial stability, right? But sustain that over time, not just help people land on their feet, but have them stay there. That's what we're really trying to do with this new strategy. And, um, 
And as part of that, um, there's a specific new thing that we're doing, um, which some of you know about. Um, some of our partners, either here in the room or online this evening, are actually part of this process with us, uh, which is fantastic. I talked to two of them earlier today. We've actually deployed 20 individuals within 15 of our agency partners. They're called navigators. And those navigators are um, situated in um, various areas across our community. Um, hang on, I'm gonna pause for one second. Do you wanna get a photo before we go? <laughs> I got you. <laughs> it all Um, all right, let's talk about these navigators. Um, so we currently serve four counties across our community, Harris County, Montgomery County, Waller County, and Fort Bend County. Um, and taking this new strategic approach, we divided that four county region into 13 regions and really thought about how we were going to deploy funds and services in our partners across the region. And one of the ways we did that was we took a data-driven approach. We took our ALICE data, and we also looked at the concentration of communities of Black, Indigenous, and people of color and overlay those across our region. So we could get it, really get a good view and take into account the systemic racism we've been talking about and is part of our collective work every single day. Um, and really thought about how we can get help where it's needed the most. Um, and so our navigators really take a personal coaching approach. They help individuals identify their needs, identify their goals, um, and then provide an individualized pathway to specific services. This is through a coordinated approach with all of our 105 funded partners. So they're really designed to help people dramatically increase their access to programs and services that the organizations like Wesley and many others provide. Um, and they're really there to be there every step of the way. Um, and so it is a little different than case management. When you think about it, it a lot of it really goes back to our Thrive Financial Stability Program, which many of you know a lot about. <laughs> um, that, that collaborative has been so amazing. It's, you know, it's its 15th year now. I know, it's been amazing. And we've doubled the number of partners that are part of that collective. And it's, it's nonprofits, it's, it's you know, regional community bank partners, it's, it's you know, other institutions of, of higher learning. And really, we've had a lot of learnings from that program, right? If you remember, that program is really, really designed to help people increase their in income, increase their savings, and acquire assets. And we've had a lot of learnings from that program over the last 15 years. So I thought I would share a few of those. These will probably not be a surprise to anyone in the room, but I'm going to share them anyway. Um, one is the importance of work-based work learning. Um, you're having to work on the right now and the future at the same time. Um, people need a paycheck today. <laughs> and so um, it's a challenge when somebody wants to upskill, right? I want to renew this certification. I want to I want to increase my ability to step into get out of a lifeboat job and really get on a career path. Um, you don't always have six months to go through a training program. Um, how do we solve those problems at the same time? Um, and we've we've got some work that we've been doing with some um, important healthcare partners across the community that that can do just that. One of the other learnings we've had, um, and again, this is a critical theme tonight, right? It takes much more than just a job or even a higher paycheck to become financially stable. Um, 
you need an understanding of your financial situation. You need to be able to navigate all the things that Congresswoman Garcia just talked about um, and, and have access and know how to use the tools and guidance to really get down that path to financial success. Um, we also know that you need to be able to put those skills to practice, right? How many of us like, we'll try to learn something and if we don't apply it, pretty, right? And bye, like right out of my head. Um, I, I can't do it um, and, and neither can you. Well, I guess some people can, but I'm not one of those people. Um, but this is really critical when it comes to financial co coaching, right? Helping people put these learnings into practice right away and do that over time. Um, and we know this too, and I know you all know this work um, in this, this concept so well. Individuals have to be at the center of this work, um, right? They're the experts in their own lives. They're the ones who should be charting this path and we should be there to meet them where they are help them identify and set their goals and then help them achieve them. Um, we also, you know, when we talked about adult literacy, right? We talked about health literacy, financial literacy, digital literacy, another big obvious key component of that foundation, right? Um, that's become more critical than ever. Um, I think, you know, people talked a lot about the digital divide and access to education in school during the height of the pandemic. Um, it took a while for people to remember like, oh, well, you, you need access to apply for jobs and navigate that whole system. It's so critical. Um, and so really helping people gain the skills to utilize the technology that's out there has got to be a huge, huge piece of this. And finally, we, we've definitely learned that this work takes time. We, we found on average, right, through our thrive programming that it can take an average of three years for someone to reach financial stability. Um, and so with this new program, we our new strategy that we've launched, our first funding cycle was a three-year cycle, and that's why, actually. To, to give our network time to work because this work takes time. Um, so, so this really, our integrated client journey approach is designed to kind of take all those learnings um, and take a little bit of a different kind of how with respect to our navigators and pull it all that together in a much more intentional, strategic, collaborative way um, to help people down that path to financial stability. Um, and tonight you've heard it, right? Um, Cross-sector collaboration is critical cannot do this work alone, right? One of our biggest learnings from COVID, I think across the community, there's no one, 10 or even 100 organizations that can meet the challenges of this university alone. It's gonna take all of us working together to make, to make this happen. Um, it takes a lot of intentional collaboration. Um, I think that's why the mayor's office, this work is really resonating, right? Because it really, it's along, along with us and so many other partners, really trying to bring everybody together um, along with the incredible work that y'all do every day at UHD um, to make sure that people in our community truly have the opportunity to prosper. So um, thanks again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I, it's been so exciting to hear about the incredible work of the mayor's office and we're so honored to, to share in this work with y'all and um, really, really appreciate it. With that, can I come back to you? And thank you so much for hanging on with us um, on, on the Zoom and us. And so um, in closing, I would like to invite President Blanchard back up to uh, close us out with one final comment. Yes, and I know it's a very brief conversation as woven between financial literacy and adult literacy. And I think it's beautiful that this obviously working in harmony with each other. President Blanchard. That part. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, but I wanted to make sure that you all were aware that, you know, this whole conversation really feels quite full circle. And what I mean by that is that about two months ago, we were notified that we, University of Houston downtown, uh, has been awarded a $2.5 million grant from the Depart U.S. Department of Commerce uh, to do what? To improve literacy skills uh, by one level uh, within the Hispanic community. Uh, using a community-based approach, meaning that the taco truck going into the community, but also working very closely with our city agencies and all of its uh, requisite agencies there within. And so I just want you to know that this could not have been planned any better uh, uh, in terms of the conversation that we heard today and that University of Houston downtown, as always, as an anchor institution, will be right in the heart of this work.
thank you again so much. Uh, I just want to give a big shout out to uh, Stephen Volano again for organizing and all the work on the back end of this work here. Thank you guys so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to come learn. Um, go forth and continue to serve our communities. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. We're really uh, uh, yeah. uh, and really <laughs> underscores the importance of the band. Yeah. Uh, Amanda. Uh, Amanda. Uh, oh. <laughs>